Welcome everyone to the 2021 Health Disparities Roundtable, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to be here. I'm John Finnegan, Dean of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, and this event is one of the most enduring that the school offers our public health community and the public in general. Believe it or not, we are rapidly closing in on 20 years of this forum. And that alone reflects in part why this is, event is so important. Racism and its manifestations of structural oppression lead to disparities, foreshortened lives, and misery that affects all of us, whether we recognize it or not. And it is therefore a true public health emergency. Imagine the possibilities of universal human thriving if racism was no longer a factor. Of course, the events of the past year have placed the challenge of structural racism in stark relief in the inequity that results. Today, we focus on COVID-19 and equity in vaccination plans and delivery. Now, yesterday at about five in the afternoon, I Googled our topic today and I used these three words, COVID-19, vaccination, equity. And in a flash, the search returned 103 million results. And 64.6 uh, .6 million of those results were news stories alone, 916,000 videos, and lots and lots of books and documents. It is strong evidence that this topic is on people's minds all over the planet. So this year's roundtable is truly timely. It's going to explore COVID-19 policy considerations and vaccination strategies through a lens of social justice and structural racism. COVID in the past year has affected marginalized communities in the worst way overall, especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color. For example, in Minnesota, they have the highest age-adjusted rates of hospitalization from COVID. And today, our panel will focus on how we can address inequities in the COVID-19 vaccine rollout in Minnesota and nationally as well. Now, before we begin, we call to mind that our School of Public Health, the University of Minnesota, and much of the region stands on the ancestral land of the Dakota people. This is the land that millennia ago they named the land where the waters reflect the skies. We acknowledge the ongoing debt that we owe to the Dakota people and their permanent relationship to this land. They were the forebears of all who came here. And today we strive to create healthy dialogue, relationships and practices that address this injustice, as well as others related to the indigenous people of this state. Now, before I yield the floor to our host and panel, I want to thank everyone that made this year's roundtable possible. And this includes the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity, the Center for Leadership Education and Maternal and Child Public Health, the Health Equity Work Group, of course, the Dean's Office and the Student Senate. And of course, the University of Minnesota Medical School Program in Health Disparities Research. And finally, I want to thank the Health Disparities Roundtable Committee for all of your hard work in planning this event. And now I am so pleased to turn over uh, the program to today's moderator, Dr. Jamie slaughter AC. And Dr. slaughter AC is an assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology in the School of Public Health. And her research focuses on the environment and uh, social factors, such as racism and discrimination that contribute to women's health the life course and with an emphasis on maternal and child health of marginalized underserved populations. And with that, Dr. slaughter AC, I yield the floor to you. Thank you and good morning, everyone. I am really excited to be moderating this very important panel uh, addressing COVID-19 vaccinations and equity. Um, and, and, you know, this week has been a very um, difficult week for many of us, given the George Floyd trial, um, I mean, the, the trial of Derek Chauvin who murdered George Floyd, the um, killing of 
uh, Duante Wright and um, the increasing numbers of hospitalizations due to COVID-19. Um, so this is very much a timely conversation with experts whose work is very timely and focused in this area. So with that, I'm going to announce the order of presenters. Um, we have Dr. Rachel Hardiman, who is Associate Professor in Blue Cross um, Endowed Professor of Health and Racial Equity, and she is the founding director of the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity here at the University of Minnesota. We have Dr. Michael Osterholm, Regents Professor in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences and Director for the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, also here at the University of Minnesota. And we have Dr. Kamara uh, Jones, who is the past president of the American Public Health Association and who I think of as a badass and truth sayer. So I would very much like to um, welcome them, and I will turn it over to our first presenter, Dr. Rachel Hardiman. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. slaughter AC, for that introduction. And um, thank you to Dean Finnegan for your comments and um, for the Health Equity Work Group and the Planning Committee for putting together um, the Health Disparities Roundtable this year. I'm delighted and honored to be here and to be on this esteemed panel with folks that I um, admire and look up to so much. So we're here today to discuss the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly the social justice policy and ethical considerations in vaccinating the United States population. And to do that, we have to begin with an understanding of just how profoundly devastating this pandemic has been for black and brown communities. I acknowledge the pain, I acknowledge, acknowledge the anguish and the frustration of stolen lives. In Stolen Breaths, my colleagues and I write, the truth is black people cannot breathe because we are currently battling at least two public health emergencies. And that is a conservative estimate. One of every 1,850 black Americans have lost their lives in this global fight against a novel virus that could have harmed anyone. And yet, because of racism and the ways humans use it to hoard resources and power for some while depriving others, it has killed an enormous number of black people. And just to note, we wrote this last May, a year ago, just after George Floyd was murdered at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer in our community. And at that time, one in every 1,800, 850 black Americans had lost their lives to COVID-19. Today, that number is actually now one in every 550 black Americans. Dr. Wrigley Field, who's a professor here at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Sociology and her colleagues examined confirmed COVID-19 mortality alongside deaths indirectly attrib attributable to the pandemic, um, that is excess mortality in Minnesota. Their analysis reveals profound racial disparities. What they see is age-adjusted excess mortality rates for white folks are exceeded by a factor of 2.8 to 5.3 for all other racial groups with the highest rates among Black, Latino, and Indigenous Minnesotans. What they conclude is that the seemingly small disparities in COVID-19 deaths in Minnesota reflect the interaction of three factors. First, the natural history of the, the disease whose early toll was hev heavily concentrated in nursing homes as we've um, learned. Second, an exceptionally divergent age distribution in the state. And third, a greatly different proportion of excess mortality captured in, in uh, confirmed COVID-19 rates for white Minnesotans compared with uh, most other groups. And what I want you to remember from this slide and from these comments is that they found an exceptionally divergent age distribution in the state. Um, that's an important point to remember as we move through um, the rest of my presentation today. And here's what the reality of COVID deaths looks like nationally, or this is what it looked like at the end of 2020. Um, 
Black and Indigenous people are dying, as we know, at disproportionately high rates. Um, in some places, the year-end mortality toll was almost incomprehensible. For example, in uh, Michigan, uh, one in 470 Black residents lost um, their lives to COVID-19. The same stats um, were seen in New Jersey as well. One in 410 Latinos um, were lost in New York and one in 300 indigenous residents who lost their lives to COVID-19 in New Mexico. And then there's the unthinkable toll of one in 140 indigenous re residents who were stolen from us in Mississippi in 2020. So the reality is that indigenous, black and Latino Americans were at least 2.7 times more likely to have died of COVID-19 than white Americans adjusted for age in 2020. And the question we have to ask is why? And the answer to that question why is rooted in structural racism. Structural racism is a system built on white supremacy that has structured opportunity and advantage for some and disadvantage and lack of opportunity for others as Dr. Kamara Jones tells us and has told us for many years. It is the normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics from historical, cultural, institutional and interpersonal that routinely advantage white people while producing cumulative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. As a fundamental cause of racial inequities and certainly a fundamental cause of inequities in COVID-19, structural racism has undermined the health, well-being, and the ability to ensure that everyone in our nation uh, thrives. As 2021 approached, I think we were all hopeful that after a year of discussing the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on black and brown communities, that uh, vaccine distribution would help level the playing field in some way. However, instead what we saw was vac vaccine distribution shine yet another spotlight on structural racism. I think it also highlighted for us the salience of distinguishing health equality from health equity. Uh, which is something that you know our public health students are learning all the time and is an incredibly important um, piece of understanding both how we have to proceed with vaccine distribution, but also in analyzing what went wrong. Um, certainly vaccine distribution, both in Minnesota and across the country has begged the question, are we taking a health equality approach or a health equity approach? Um, equality meaning um, that we've given everyone the exact same resources. Um, whereas health equity um, means that we've distributed resources based on the needs of the recipients. And when we think about this within the context of COVID, the COVID-19 vaccine distribution, giving everyone equal access, for example, through online scheduling certainly has exacerbated inequities in vaccine access and thus uptake. When we prioritize equality over equity, we get the results we've seen through the, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. The disparities grow wider and wider. Instead, starting with strategies that provide equitable solutions um, where we could actually then address the um, inequities that we're witnessing across the country. So take for instance, Minnesota, you know, our approach here was to start by vaccinating, opening access to those over the age of 65 for vaccination. And what you see on this slide is actually um, the, the dashboard report, most recent dashboard uh, report. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but you know, now I want you to think back to that second or third slide that I shared with Dr. Wrigley Field's findings from her, um, from her study on it, where they said that Minnesota has an exceptionally divergent age distribution in the state. And what that means is that for Minnesota, respective mean ages are 41 years for white people, 29 years for black people, 24 years for Latinos, and 31 years for Asian Americans, and 32 years for, for native um, or indigenous populations in our state. So Minnesota's difference in white versus black mean age is actually the fifth largest across the United States. And that's driven in part from our, um, our state's large black immigrant population, which tends to be younger. So by starting vaccine rollout with a 65 plus population in Minnesota, we have further exacerbated disparities in COVID risk and exposure, hospitalization, ICU use and death because we reached a predominantly white population. And I suspect we'll see the ramifications of this decision for years to come. And again, this is data from our most recent COVID vaccine dashboard where we see that while black Americans comprise between six and 7% of our population in the state, 
we make up only 3.7% of vaccinations, while our white counterparts, for our white counterparts, the vaccination rates are exceedingly high. So I would submit to you today that our vaccine distribution process is an important case study in structural racism, and we haven't even begun to sort of peel back all the layers of um, what's happened and what will continue to happen here. Again, structural racism is baked into our systems, our policies and procedures, and it's these patterns and practices that reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and the distribution of resources, again, like vaccines. So our state policies on vaccine allocation dictated from the start, um, if equitable vaccine distribution would happen, those policies in turn trickled down into the decisions um, our healthcare systems and other systems were able to make. So what we've seen happen then is that our structures and our systems simply defaulted to inequity, right? Um, as they often do. And as a result, black and brown people were left behind. Um, because of structural racism, we disregarded the data that pointed to who was most impacted by COVID-19, who most needed to be vaccinated early on. And so by failing to lead with equity, we in turn perpetuated inequitable systems that have led to even more suffering in our communities, both here locally, but also across the country. And now many states, Minnesota included, um, are trying to wrap equity into this process and, and retrofit it into a system and into a process that didn't start with equity. Um, and so we're relying often on our community organizations, on our federally qualified health centers and others to um, step up and really support these efforts. You know, I often think about what would have happened in Philadelphia without the heroic efforts of Dr. Um, Dr. Alice Stanford and the Black Doctors COVID Consortium. You know, they decided they weren't going to sit around and wait for someone to um, save their community, and they took it into their own hands and have vaccinated an extraordinary number of Black and Brown um, folks in Philadelphia. I think what we must remember is that the structure in the system will always default to inequity if we let it. If equity is an afterthought, it will always get left behind. We had the data um, pointing to who was at greatest risk. Um, we had people requesting, even begging in some, in some instances, um, for us to, to rethink this process. In, and this is all amidst this year where we've had this um, you know, racial awakening in, in, the, um, in response to uh, George Floyd's murder. And yet we still have not centered equity and let equity lead this process. And we have to ask ourselves why. So equity and vaccine distribution. Um, and I think what we'll, we'll talk about in the Q&A and the discussion amongst the panelists, we'll really dig into a lot more of this. Um, so I only offer a few uh, points uh, here right now, but I think equity and vaccine distribution means we have structures again and policies and practices that are leading with equity rather than equity being that afterthought um, or equity taking the back seat in the name of speed and efficiency. I, I think we can hold both of those. We can hold efficiency and speed of getting folks vaccinated um, and equity sort of in the same space. Um, we have to do a better job of removing structural barriers, whether that's cost, access, time off work, internet access, and many, many more barriers. Um, and part of that means bringing the vaccines to the people, meeting people where they're at with what they need, and focusing overall on the policies and unequal systems rather than individual actions. So in closing, in my, in my 10 minutes of comments today, um, you know, I, I have to say that any solution to racial health inequities and COVID-19 deaths in vaccine equity or in the loss of life at the hands of uh, police must be rooted in the material conditions in which those inequities thrive. Our communities are suffering trauma after trauma, and we have to address the social, the economic, the political, the legal, the educational and healthcare systems that maintain structural racism in order to heal. Um, I, our, as, as Dr. Slaughter AC opened her comments with, it's been a hard week here in Minnesota. It's been a hard week, I think for black and brown people across our country as we experience one trauma after the, another, whether it's at the hands of police or something else. And I just wanna lift up the families that are suffering right now. Um, Adam Toledo's family in Chicago, um, George Floyd's family here in the Twin Cities and across the country, and Dante Wright's family in Brooklyn Center, and remind people that at our core, Black people are loved. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Harneman, for that wonderful and very poignant um, presentation. I know you raised a lot of um, really good questions and points. Um, and we're going to have to save them for the discussion time. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thanks. <laughs> So our next speaker is um, Dr. Michael Alsterholm, Regent Professor of Division, uh, Regent Professor in the Division of Environmental Health Sciences and Director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor slaughter AC. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here uh, with you today. Uh, I particularly am very touched to be on the same panel with Dr. Hardiman and Dr. Jones, two dear friends and also mentors to me. So while I may have a title of Regents Professor, please understand I'm the student here today as much as many of you are. This issue uh, is one with uh, COVID-19 that from its very earliest days has been a challenge with regard to uh, structural racism. Uh, but I wanna start out by just one very sober reminder of what this pandemic has been all about here in this country. Uh, Dr. Paula Kidman and colleagues this past week uh, published an article uh, digging deep into the impact that COVID-19 has had on families throughout the United States. And they were able to determine that between 37,300 and 43,000 children age 17 or younger have lost a parent to COVID-19. Compare that to the 3,000 uh, children who lost a parent in 9-11, a tragic situation in of itself. But what was most notable is that while 14% of U.S. children lost a parent to COVID this past uh, year and a, three months, 20% of Black children have lost a parent. Again, emphasizing the very points that Dr. Hardiman just made about the disproportionate impact that this pandemic has had. Let me just say at the outset, you've already seen the data from Dr. Hardiman. I don't think anyone needs to be convinced that there in fact is a real challenge here. But I, I, let me just lay out a couple of points that I think uh, for purposes of our ongoing discussion really merit uh, consideration why and what can we do about it. I will suggest right now, if we're not part of the solution, then we are part of the problem. And today we need to find what we can do for solutions. And I'll explain why that is even more critical in the days ahead. First of all, access has been absolutely a major barrier to uh, having individuals be able to match up with a vaccine dose. No question about it. Uh, we know that uh, when we look at, at uh, particularly in the BIPOC community, access in terms of their ability to access internet-based uh, uh, functions in terms of getting uh, appointments, being able to get to those appointments to get the vaccines have all been uh, uh, very difficult challenges in many communities throughout the country. The ability to deliver the vaccine has also been tied to the very venues of which it's available. Uh, something that, uh, you know, we may be able to drive 15 miles or 20 miles to get a vaccine dose. Uh, I can tell you right now, I have far too many of my friends and colleagues who have driven 120 miles to rural Minnesota to get a vaccine dose. That often isn't available in many ways to those from, from particularly the, the communities of color as we know them here in terms of what the access they've had to vaccine. So access is real, we'll talk more about that. But the other thing we haven't done as a public health community, we haven't understood vaccinations occur only when that needle is in the arm. That last inch is critical. And when you look at this vaccine as it was rolled out, it was a tremendous success story from a operation warp speed, helping to move these vaccines through in light speed uh, relative to safety, uh, their ability to understand, uh, in fact, how well that they were actually going to work and what they would do. But we didn't really explain ever what Operation Warp Speed was about. It was a horrible name to give a, a, a process like this because it immediately conjured up in the minds of many the lack of safety, that somehow the steps were taken uh, to get through. Second of all is we did have over and over again the understanding that the US military was involved with this. Now I can tell you from a logistic standpoint, they have served a very important useful purpose. But if I'm uh, someone in the community 
hearing about these Operation Warp Speeds with military involvement. And frankly, there were a lot of rumors about the fact that there was a political thumb put on the scale to get these vaccines approved, which wasn't true in the end, but it surely fits the narrative of why we might distrust this. Then we deliver in the first two major vaccines, ones that are called messenger RNA vaccines, which in, by their very name and the fact that some perceive this as a brand new technology, which is not, that in fact, again, makes people skeptical. Well, then you add in the decades and decades and decades of structural racism around the delivery of vaccines. And while you know I've heard from many, let's drop the concept that Tuskegee should ever be brought up again, that we've moved beyond that, I don't think we have. I think we still owe a debt to the black community in understanding why in fact that won't happen again. It can't happen again. And so if you add those points up, there's lots of reasons why even if we can get the vaccine to the community, we have not done the work we need to do to tell the story of these vaccines by trusted leaders in the BIPOC community, such that they can trust these vaccines and understand the fact that if we don't use these vaccines, the kinds of data that uh, Dr. Hardiman has just shared with you only become more acute. So I look at the issue of equity and, and what we talk about in terms of moving vaccines into the, the general public is it's not just access in of itself, but we owe our communities a story of why these vaccines should be a part of their uh, everyday lives and saving those lives. The other part that uh, I, I just wanna raise is that even within the United States, we already realize the challenges we have with regard to the access and availability of these vaccines as, as Dr. Hardeman has just laid out. But when you look at it globally, it's even much more acute. Today, 10 countries, all high income countries have had access to 83% of all the vaccine delivered. Think of all the low and middle income countries where again, at this point, disparities are even more acute of even the possibility of having a vaccine in your country, let alone whether or not you may have access to it. And on a global basis, we have to address this from a, an equity rights standpoint uh, and from the standpoint, frankly, of what it means for the rest of the world from a humanitarian standpoint and from the standpoint of protecting these vaccines from new variants that might develop that would then challenge all the vaccines that we have. And if we see unfettered transmission occurring in low and middle income countries, yes, we should approach that first and foremost from a humanitarian standpoint, but let's just even take it at the most uh, fundamental of all issues is we have to make sure we don't have these infections so that we don't see the variants that will threaten everyone's vaccine. Now, where are we at today? This I think will be a point of continued discussion because as uh, while we see Minnesota data for uh, access to vaccines by uh, race, let me tell you that it's an acute problem in a much greater way in a number of states throughout the country. Minnesota, believe it or not, is among the top of the states in the country in terms of availability and delivery of these vaccines. And why is this a concern? Because as some of you uh, have, you've been following COVID know that I and others have been saying that this new B117 variant that is now in North America is gonna pose significant challenge in the days ahead, even with the level of vaccines that we see out there. Look no further than what's happening in Michigan right now. And when you look and see where those cases are still continuing to occur at high rates, again, the disparity is huge in terms of who is now the current cases. Michigan is at a point where they are seeing uh, the same number of cases with real severity uh, in their population as they did during the last big surge of cases in November. Unfortunately, Minnesota is not far behind. So this issue is not done. I think many people think, well, we can go back and, and do a, uh, some kind of a hot wash or a, a review of what happened and make better prepared for the future. But in fact, this issue is acute right now. And I worry that we are only going to exacerbate these structural racism issues uh, with vaccine availability, who gets the vaccine, and the number of cases that will occur over the days ahead. We are far from done with this virus. And so this particular program today is not about a, an evaluation of what we've done today because we're done. 
It hopefully is merely a check-in point to say, we've got a lot of immediate work to do right now because the days ahead are going to be very, very uh, challenging. So let me just close as someone, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here as a Regents professor and I take that honor with great responsibility. But let me say today, I'm actually here like so many others as a student. We need to learn about what we are faced with here in these discussions and what we can do about them. And again, I close with one last comment. If we're not part of the solution, we are part of the problem. And so today, I think as we discuss this, you'll hear much more about what we can do about that. And again, thank you for inviting me, uh, uh, you know, Professor Hardiman, Professor Jones, it is such an honor to be on the same uh, program with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osterholm. That was, um, I think, an amazing talk and very informative given what, what's going on now and where um, many of our minds are situated in thinking that, I think the general population thinks that we can very much um, start returning back to normal. And I love what you just said about if we are not part of the solution, we are part of the problem. And um, really speaking to the fact that we live in this continuum and um, from an infectious disease lens, why equity is so important um, to that continuum um, locally, nationally, and globally. Our next speaker, is Dr. Kamara Jones, who's the past president of the American Public Health Association. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Slaughter AC. And it is my pleasure to join uh, in this roundtable with these two amazing colleagues. And I am going to wrap up our prepared remarks before we start discussion with one another and then with you by saying, what do racism and COVID-19 have in common? Uh, and the idea, first of all, they're all killing us. <laughs> they're all pandemics, endemic, racism is endemic uh, and pandemic in the US and, and, and COVID-19 is pandemic. But what they have in common is the same structures that allow for racism denial and COVID denial and the like. So that's gonna be kind of the thesis, that the, the, the ladder on which I'm gonna um, hang my remarks. I just wanted to start by sharing my definition of racism to which uh, Dr. Hardiman referred before, understanding that racism is a system that does two things. It's a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks, which is what we call race. And it has three impacts. It unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, but every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage. So it's also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. You could just look at the data that Dr. Hardiman showed in terms of the vaccine access to understand that. But it is also sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And when Dr. Hardiman ended with the pictures of just a few of the souls and the genius and the leadership that we've lost due to police violence. And then when we magnify that due to COVID-19, and then when we magnify that due to maternal mortality differences and infant mortality and on and on and on, racism is sapping the strength, not just of families or communities, but of this whole society. And I would say COVID is doing the same. Now, I have in the past described what at first I was calling seven societal or cultural barriers to achieving health equity, which I then framed as seven values targets for anti-racism action, which I now understand as seven social delusions that undergird racism denial. So however you want me to title this, but the, the, the benign title here is barriers to achieving health equity. I'm going to share with you these seven values targets for anti-racism action and then lift up how these are also operating with regard to how we're responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and are hampering our response. The first of these seven barriers is that in this nation, we are very narrowly focused on the individual. And this narrow focus on the individual makes systems and structures 
either invisible or seemingly irrelevant. It also makes our sense of self-interest very narrowly defined. So we may not even include our cousins or aunts and uncles in self, much less the people who live across town. It gives us a limited sense of their but for the grace of God go I, or interdependence, or we are all in this together, or I am my brother's and my sister's keeper, which manifests in terms of our uh, racial dynamic in this country, and as of course we're going to talk about in COVID-19 as well, and a limited sense of collective efficacy. So even when we try to think about our power to change things, we often frame that power as what can I do and then feel defeated when we say, well, what can I do about racism? I guess I'm just going to keep on whatever, whatever I'm doing in the inaction, the inaction in the face of need, because we feel overwhelmed when actually the correct question is what can we do? And we need to have an understanding of collective efficacy. The second of these seven barriers is the fact that in this country, we are a historical. We act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were just a happenstance. And when you are a historical and you're born and you see things a certain way, you assume they've always been that way and always need to stay that way. And it, so it even limits our idea of how we can change systems and structures. So we actually need to be studying the history of successful societal change, even right now, because as many people have said, we do not want to let this moment of mobilization after the murder of George Floyd and many others that is continuing, unfortunately, to be fueled by more and more murders coming to the police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women uh, coming to national attention. We need to make, go from a moment of naming racism in this nation to a movement, to a national campaign against racism. So let's read up. All of us, especially in the movement, we've got to understand our history. The third of these seven barriers is the myth of meritocracy. The story that goes something like this. If you work hard, you will make it. Now, I give you that most people who have made it have worked hard. Although not everybody who's made it has worked hard. We've seen some prominent examples of that, but most people who have made it have worked hard. But even still, there are many, many, many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field, which has been structured and is being perpetuated by racism, sexism, heterosexism, economic systems like capitalism and the like. And when we deny these systems of structured inequity, including racism, then we actually blame those who haven't made it for being lazy or stupid. And there are many ways to deny racism. We've heard some of them, people just saying, I don't think racism exists. Even in our healthcare industry, uh, with the whole JAMA podcast from February 23rd, another story. But, but another way to deny racism is to be talking about everything but. So even if we in our work are talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, cultural humility, cultural competence, cult, you know, structural competence, disparities, disproportionalities, race, we could talk about all of that stuff, but if we never say the word racism in our national context of widespread and staunchly held and very seductive racism denial, if we don't say the word racism in our context of racism denial, we are complicit with that denial. The fourth of these seven barriers to achieving health equity is the myth of a zero sum game. That if you gain, I lose, which sets us up in competition with one another. It masks the cost of inequity. It masks the fact that all of these systems of structured inequity, uh, including racism, sap the strength of the whole society and it hinders efforts to grow the pie. It's almost as if I'm sitting at a potluck dinner. I see you coming. I don't want you anywhere near the table because I think you're gonna come and just eat up all the food. I don't even recognize that you're bringing cakes and pies and roasts and salads and fruits and all kinds of delicious food with you because I don't even value you. The fifth of these seven barriers to achieving health equity is our limited future orientation, especially in this nation. You know, so the parts of the future that we can touch, each of us right now, are the children and the planet. In this country, we have a disregard for the children and a usurious relationship with the planet. And with regard to the children and our disregard 
for their children. Many American Indian nations, indigenous peoples have a seven generations hence approach to decision making. When they're looking at a policy, they're asking the question, what is going to be the impact in 100 years? We do not have that kind of outlook. And in East Africa, I'm told that the Maasai people, when they greet one another, don't say, hey, how you're doing? They greet each other with a question, how are the children? Hoping to get back the answer, all the children are well. In this country, we don't even ask how are the children. And if we did, we would not get the answer, all the children are well. The seventh, I mean, the sixth of these seven barriers to achieving health equity is our endorsement of the myth of American exceptionalism, which really, I mean, we say American exceptionalism when we really mean US exceptionalism. We've claimed the whole North, Central and South America to be us, right? But this myth that in the United States that, that we are so different, so special, so uniquely ordained by God that special privileges should accord to us and that the usual rules don't accord to us and that there's nothing we can learn from other countries. And here, I just have to say, although I've been talking about this from the point of racism, COVID, you can clearly see the impact of this on COVID-19. If we had only paid a little attention to what other countries were doing to, to uh, control their pan, the pandemic as it expressed in their nations, there would have been hundreds of thousands of lives saved in this nation. And now this myth of American exceptionalism makes us not even question what Dr. Osterholm just closed his remarks with, the fact that we are sucking up the global vaccine supply and at the same time interfering with the notion that the recipes for the vaccines could be shared widely around the world so that people could, other nations could create this life-saving medication, whatever vaccine. The seventh, I realized I'm talking deeply into my slides, so I'm gonna speed up because I, I need to be almost done. The seventh of these seven barriers to achieving health equity, the seven values targets for anti-racism action is white supremacist ideology, which I don't use as a lightning rod term, but instead as a simple description of the false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race. There is no such hierarchy. And the falser notion that even if there were such a hierarchy that would put white people at the top as the ideal or the norm, but this white supremacist ideology actually gives many people who are living as white a sense of entitlement. It has resulted in the devaluation and indeed dehumanization of people of color manifest in the brutal murder of Mr. George Floyd and fear at the browning of America that underlies a lot of our political divide today. So I have given you seven barriers for achieving health equity. I'm gonna focus on only one, the narrow focus on the individual with regard to how it has stymied our efforts with regard to the COVID-19 response. So the narrow focus on the individual and the COVID-19 pandemic, and quickly I'm gonna give you how it looked up. When I first was understanding the pandemic, I saw it in testing, and then I saw it how it reflected in masking, and then I saw how it reflected in how we were talking about school reopenings, and then in the vaccine trial endpoints, and then I saw it again, honest to God, this is you know, vaccine optimism, and then I saw it in terms of how we were phasing the vaccine rollout, and even how we're talking about COVID-19 death. So very quickly, with regard to testing, a medical care approach is how we've been treating this pandemic as this, this were a medical care issue, not a public health problem. And even at the beginning, we were confirming individual diagnoses for those who are symptomatic or exposed, and that's still what we're mostly doing. A public health approach would be to estimate population prevalence using probability surveys that included testing asymptomatic persons. Why does it matter? the time delay in our prevalence estimates. Because when you are looking at positive tests of symptomatic people, you are seven to 10 days behind the real action, right? It's like a Polaroid picture that took seven to 10 days to develop. Hospitalizations represent a two to three week delay in terms of understanding the real prevalence in your population. Deaths a three to five week delay where probability surveys would be real time. And if we didn't even wanna do probability surveys or whole population uh, you know, censuses in given places, we could even just start uh, checking the wastewater to get a better sense. In terms of masking, an individual orientation says that we wear masks primarily to protect oneself. A collective orientation says we wear masks primarily to protect others. Why does it matter, our orientation? Mask mandates are essential to protect the health of the public in the face of individual objections, which include there's no virus, or I'm not vulnerable, or masks make you sick, or masks are uncomfortable. So like knowing that people have these ideas, mask mandates are where we need to go. In terms of school reopenings, an individual focus at the beginning says, oh, the children don't seem to be getting that sick. A community focus 
acknowledges that children can spread the disease into populations. And I know the CDC has uh, looked at some older papers, but honestly, we should look at newer data because in the UK, the way that they even picked up the B117 variant was when they started seeing child spread into the community with that variant. So, but anyway, why does it matter? We need to have safeguards against the spread from schools into communities, especially with B117 becoming more ascendant. Vaccine trial endpoints. An individual focus when people were designing the trials was symptomatic disease as the primary endpoint, whereas a population focus would have had them swabbing the, the participants in the trials every week just to identify asymptomatic viral infection as another endpoint of interest. Now we know a little bit more about that, but why does it matter? It's because asymptomatic spread is what is fueling the pandemic. In terms of vaccine op optimism, here's the background. This virus has one job, it will affect any available vulnerable host. Now, a focus on vaccines decreases the vulnerability of individual hosts, but the focus on public health strategies decreases the number of available hosts if you're masking and keeping social distancing and washing your hands and not having big group gatherings. Why does it matter? We need to fully implement and continue to fully implement public health strategies, both individual and at the governmental level, even as we roll out these highly anticipated vaccines. We should not go vaccine crazy optimistic, as Dr. Osterholm said when he closed his remarks. In terms of the vaccine rollout phases, individual risk says that acknowledges that there is increased vulnerability due to age or medical conditions, but an acknowledgement of structural risk acknowledges there's increased exposure either at work or where we live. And so the vulnerability piece, that's the 65 plus, the increase, the structural risk was manifest in our first, in our phase 1A where healthcare workers and people in long-term care facilities, but the healthcare workers were not the only ones exposed at work. Those in long-term care facilities that was interpreted as nursing homes and did not include prisons or jails or you know, in, uh, detention centers and the like. So we had an incomplete understanding of structural risk and then we let the individual risk as Dr. Hardiman said, you know, all of the older 65 plus, which is at least in Minnesota and all around the country uh, enriched with white folks because they have longer life expectancies because of racism. Anyway, so why does it matter? Vaccine allocation addressing structural risk will address the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color. That is what Dr. Hardiman was calling for when you lead with equity is acknowledging structural risk because that's what made us more infected, dying more, and that's what we need to do when we're doing a vaccine response. And finally, with regard to the COVID death toll, an individual focus says, well, those people dying from COVID-19 represent private losses to loved ones. A collective focus says those dying from COVID-19 represent shared losses to the whole society. Why does that matter? We all need to recognize and mourn our monumental 560,000 I've lost count, lives lost as a nation, even those who have not yet experienced the loss of a family member, friend, or colleague. So I just want to say when we talk about racism, there are four key messages that it, racism exists, racism is a system, racism saps the strength of the whole society, and we can act to dismantle racism. And I encourage you guys, I have developed allegories that help illustrate all of these. I encourage you to look it up after all is said and done because we all need to be messengers about racism. We all need to recognize those four key messengers, messages and being unafraid in naming racism and being unafraid to be social justice equity warriors. Thank you very much. Thank you, <laughs> Dr. Jones. Um, I almost do not want to come back on and moderate and just let you continue talking because- And I'm sorry if I went long, I just saw the time, but anyway. I'm no, sorry. because this, that was, I mean, <clears throat> as a person who studies the impacts of racism, there was so much that you unpacked there and in a way that you unpacked it, that it, it, it just, it was, it was beautiful, <laughs> I have to say, and that I learned a lot in that. Um, and one of the things that really resonated me with me when you were talking and closing out is that we cannot apply anti-racist approach 
unless we are willing to take risk in naming it, in naming racism, and then tackling racism. Yes. And that, I think that is so key. And whatever that risk is, that first step, like on, on an individual and collective basis, whatever that risk represents, we need to step into that discomfort and take that risk. And may I just build on that? Indifference and inaction in the face of need is how structural racism, so indifference, I guess, maybe on the personal immediated thing, but inaction in the face of need is how structural racism very, very often manifests these days. Inaction in the face of need in terms of the vaccine rollout, inaction in the face of need in terms of uh, how we fund public schools based on local property taxes and the disproportionate impact this has. Inaction in the face of need in terms of the water uh, poisoning, lead poisoning in Flint. Inaction in the face of need so many times, this is how structural racism Uh oh, we might have lost Dr. Jones there for a little bit, um, but I will I will sort of segue this over to the rest of the the panel, um, and allow time for uh, Dr. Jones to rejoin us um, if she's able to. Um, but just kind of continuing on this theme about collective action um, and thinking about sort of individual risk here. Um, you know, I think when all of you all were talking, <laughs> um, it kept, I, in my mind, I kept um, thinking about colorblind racism, right? And how since the, what we call the end of the civil rights movement in the mid seventies, um, this country has been adopting more and more um, colorblind policies. And what we see is that these colorblind policies tie the anti-racist um, movement's hand behind its back um, in a way in that policies that would sort of call out race and the unequitable distribution of resources that would help ensure health equity, people are afraid to, um, to take on in part because whether or not they're afraid of being sued or the Supreme Court may, call, may nullify it, et cetera. And so I think, I, I think it's important to talk about that because of some of the data that uh, Dr. Hardiman, sorry, my friend, Rachel, but to everyone else, Dr. Hardiman. <laughs> <laughs> has um, brought to the forefront in, think, in, in knowing that we have this um, life expectancy gap that um, when you apply the, the 65 and plus policy um, on, for vaccinations um, leads to inequity. Yeah, I think, um, do you mind if I jump in, Dr. slaughter AC? Nope, go ahead. I mean, I think that's exactly right. And I think what we're seeing in a lot of states is this colorblind approach, right, to um, the decision-making and the policy process around um, vaccine um, distribution. And, you know, I think a lot of the work that Dr. Jones has laid the groundwork for, and certainly other scholars across the country, um, and your work, Dr. Sauter, you see in mine as well, you know, has really framed racism as a risk factor for health, right? And so what if we had decided racism is the risk factor for um, COVID-19, just like we said that, you know, type one and type two diabetes is a risk factor or 
you know, chronic, other chronic diseases or comorbidities were risk factors. We could have named race as a risk factor and then proceeded accordingly, um, knowing that it, racism has, um, has such a profound impact on the health and well-being and the, um, and the lifespan of, of black and brown folks. Although I want to jump in, Dr. Hardiman, and say, in our context, so I agree with you, but in our context, if we said racism was a risk factor, people would hear that as race as the risk factor and then would immediately biologize it. Yes. And even if we started with race yeah. as the risk factor, understanding that that's the substrate on which racism operates day to day and that's the only reason it's a risk factor, but people would again biologize it. So I am with you for what, how we needed to do that. And that's why um, it's, a hard, it's, a, it's a hard thing in the context of racism denial. All, right. all of our work, all of our work is in this looming black hole context of racism denial. You can't see the denial, but it's got mass and it's sucking things into it, including those interventions, right? Yep. So, so I've started actually thinking that racism denial is a target for our action too. But, but in the short term, the way that I sort of think about reframing it is, well, let's talk about structural risk. Right. Because racism is what actually creates that structural risk. It's because of racism that people of color in the more uh, low paid frontline essential jobs without adequate protection and all of that. It's because of racism that we're more burdened by chronic diseases because of living in segregated disinvested communities and, and all of that. So, but if we talk about the structural uh, risk, far be it, no, don't misunderstand me. I'm all for calling out racism. That's, that's Kamara, Name racism Jones, right, okay. <laughs> but if we have to go through, Kamara name racism Jones, but we have to call it race, people aren't ready. No. I, I'd like to hear some pushback on this because this is controversial. I know what I'm saying. Yeah. I'll say I agree with you. I don't think people are quite ready yet. Just, I mean, simply, you know, just in my work, I'd people, I still am fighting with people to recognize that race is a social construct. Mm -hmm. um, racial classification is a system and a process. Right. And there is nothing biological about race. If you want to talk about genetic ancestry, let's talk about genetic ancestry, right. but don't, right. don't yeah. put that under the umbrella of race. Those are yeah. two different things. Very different things. Yeah. Absolutely. So, but then, so how do we target then? So how do we get how do we do the equity first, recognizing that racism has created these things? I mean, maybe we can solve this problem right here between the three of us in, in two minutes. <laughs> I'm asking you for real. Well, you took my question. <laughs> <laughs> so, the three yeah. of you is that how do we address how do we address this? How do we how do we address this so we can then move to the next piece? of the, the puzzle that we are solving, right? So, so we, do we just keep saying race is the substrate on which racism operates and, and because racism is operating on it with regard to COVID, we need to pay attention to race right now. It is that there's nothing biological about, you know, there's no you know, predisposition, there's nothing that's the reason we need to focus on black folks is because we are most in harm's way because of racism. That's a long sentence, but that might be just what we have to do. And also- I, I do, oh, go ahead. I say, and also get leaders in place that um, understand that race is a social construct, right? <laughs> um, and that pathway and understand deeply, right? What that pathway from racism into structural oppression and structural inequity really looks like. Um, because if we have folks who are making decisions who don't truly, truly understand, you know, what you just described, Dr. Jones, I mean, I, I think we can speak on all of these panels all day long, but it's only, you know, very slowly going to shift, you know, or push the, push the um, needle there. You know, at, at, and during my presentation, I said twice, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're right. part of the problem. And I think one of the things that is very difficult today trying to move this area forward is bringing together the collective we. Mm -hmm. Because this isn't about race when it comes to who needs to address the issue. It's about all of us. Mm 
you know, I, I would just say right at the outset here, you know, as an old white man, you know, it's hard for me to know how I should engage this. I can personalize it a lot by saying, you know what, I've never had to drive home at night in my entire life and worry if I got pulled over what that might do to me. I've never worried about, I've never thought about that. And I think that in this discussion here, this is a very uncomfortable topic for a lot of people. Uh, one, because they either may disagree that it's even real, or number two is what do I do about it in such a way that I actually am part of the solution? And I think you know, uh, having these kind of forums are really helpful because it allows those who never have imagined that racism is real, you know, it's, it doesn't affect my life, so it must not happen. Number two is that if it does happen, you know, what can I do about it? And number three is why does it make a difference? And I think that, you know, th at this point, I find that often when I deal with COVID-19 uh, issues and talk about access and talk about things like why, you know, we have a obligation to explain these vaccines in ways that are culturally sensitive, that are culturally real, and don't count on it just being my explanation. You know, it's like if you don't speak English, but I only give you instructions in English, you know, what have I accomplished? Well, I think the same thing is true in terms of how we do these vaccines. So, so I think one of the things that I will just say that has made it possible for me to be more involved with is being able to deal with the people like the three of you who have been kind enough to mentor me, to help me. And I think we need to understand how to do that better. And I don't mean it in a soft way. I mean it, you know, we don't have time. We, this is a crisis and, and it's a crisis we got to deal with. So I'm not looking for a 10 year plan. I'm looking for a, you know, a t plan right now. And, but at the same time, I think what you can do to help teach people like me who can then use my own influence and, and, and position to help further this is going to be a really important point of addressing this issue. May I, you, Dr. Osterholm? I just want to say that I think that is um, what you just said is so valuable because I know at the beginning of this pandemic, when me and other Black epidemiologists were saying that racism is intersecting with this pandemic, I was greeted or we were greeted by other public health people saying, what does racism have to do with this? Right, exactly. Which comes from an incomplete understanding of what racism is, yep. because people think when you say the word racism, that you're talking about something between people or you're trying to divide the room into who's racist and who's not, or you're trying to peer deeply into somebody's soul and say exactly how racist are you. So that vital understanding, one, that racism exists, but two, that racism is a system that's that's the that's the piece that many people miss mm -hmm. because if we knew that in december of 2019 or maybe it was as early as november we don't know really when the virus started but but up until that point there were there were no humans on this planet that was were immune to this virus and so if opportunity were equally distributed mm -hmm. and exposure to risk were equally distributed then there would be no way you could slice and dice the population and yep. find differences in infection rates or death rates. Yep. So when we saw that we did see these differences, it was just evidence that opportunity and exposure to risk were not equally distributed by race in this country. But people think of racism. Uh, there was some, some man, I never heard of him before, but somebody sent me a clip Oh, I can't, I won't go there because I can't know his name or anything, but so never mind. I, it's, a, it's a, a black apologist, a black apologist for, for saying how could racism be involved with, and I forgot what he was trying to say racism wasn't involved with, maybe COVID. Um, that um, this trying to, trying to ignore the fact that systems and structures exist. So again, that narrow focus on the individual, even when you say the word racism plays up and it keeps us from understanding what we need to do. So here are the three tasks. We need to name racism, all of us. And I don't think it's a scary thing. I think it's an empowering thing because it doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act. You have to name racism in all of your places. 
right? And if people are confused, then, then I wouldn't even give them a book about you know, this or that about racism, I would give them a book about history. <laughs> you know, just read history. Right. And that will help you understand racism, right? The second thing is ask the question, how is racism operating here in my setting, in my child's daycare, in my workplace or whatever, looking at structures, policies, practices, norms, and values. How do you look at those things? Those are the elements of decision-making. Structures are the who, what, when, and where of decision-making, especially who's at the table and who's not, what's on the agenda and what's not. Policies are the written how of decision-making. Practices and norms are the unwritten how of decision-making and values are the why. So you can take that question, think about these different levels of decision-making and figure out how is racism operating here? Mm -hmm. I do it all the time when I'm asked to speak for different groups. I sit 15 minutes and I generate a list of five or 10 initial targets for action, initial levers for inter possible intervention. Then once you do that analysis, the third step, name racism, ask how is racism operating here? The third is to organize and strategize to act. Don't be the only one up there with your hand up, you need to find your people yep. <laughs> or create your people, right? And then you organize and strategize to act. Otherwise they'll slice us down one by one. So when we talk about the real fear of it, don't go out there by yourself, be in a flock. <laughs> yeah. I love that be in a flock. <laughs> that is so true. I have had to uh, definitely figure out who my flock is yep. and, yep. Um, you know, Proceed accordingly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rachel, you my flock. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, uh, Dr. Jones definitely hit one of our questions that our audience members um, um, asked in talking about how interconnected our systems are, po uh, policing, healthcare, education, Etc. And how do we approach one without addressing and dismantling all of um, all of the systems? Um, and I think um, she addressed a lot of that. But I'd like to give our our other speakers a chance to add anything else to it. Could I ask a, a question here of the two speakers today, or all three of you actually? You know, you you just said I think something very very important about. Uh, and it was almost passed off as, as some humor, is about how to be part of the flock. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me, I mean, help me, help, help all the people on here listening that want to be part of the flock. They know that's the right thing to do. They understand how critical it is to the very foundational aspects of public health. And yet they're not quite sure how to become part of the flock. You know, we're, we're, we don't have the same level of expertise or the same ownership of the issues, the same wisdom and experience as you do, but how, 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 how do we become part of the flock? What do we do? Where, where, where do we start? Where do we go next? Well, first, Rachel, I mean, well, I was just going to say, I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of that is what Dr. Jones just outlined, right? And saying, um, you know, being, being willing to show up in conversations, to name racism, to ask how it's operating, um, to, to be openly open and clear that you value the work. Um, you know, I ended my presentation with the fact that black people are loved. Um, we yeah. wrote that in the New England Journal of Medicine, right? And the fact that, that those words need to be written and need to be published says a lot about where we're at. And so being able to say that and to live that and I think to truly value that um, and find folks who, who also do, you know, that's how I found my people. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's an incredible, it's, it's, it's figuring out, um, you know, those shared values. But I, I also take it, so yes, yes to Dr. Hardiman. Dr. Osterholm, I know that you might be in circles where people haven't even started Mm -hmm. uh, naming racism. Right. So here's a real, a real hint. Um, my 2000 paper, Levels of Racism, um, a theoretic framework in a gardener's tale, four pages, two pages front and back, take that to your next meeting or to your next lunch and learn or, you know, mm -hmm. team, whatever, and have people just read it and discuss it. That is how people will hear each other talking about these issues. And then after the meeting, 
then you might go and say, oh, well, I really appreciated how you were talking about the gardener's tale. Okay, well, now let's think about how we're going to work on such and such. Yeah. So people, I have said that before, people have used that strategy and they have started finding their flock that way. So just a four page paper. It's very old now. And of course, you, if it's people so don't want relevant. <laughs> yeah. it's very relevant. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And if, if people don't want to read, um, the fact that I've been out here for decades and, and survived is because I talk about racism through allegory. So the Gardner's Tale was the first one, but there's mm-hmm. a, a 2014 TEDx Emory. So if you Google Kamar Jones TED Talk, where I do a four allegories very quickly, but four of them, these are tools that because of the storytelling of real life things, an open clothes sign, gardeners boxes, you know, Japanese lanterns, a conveyor belt, you know, like these are things that people have seen with their own eyes. And then you make it a story about racism. They can really remember, they can share it with other people and they can understand. So I suggest as a way to ease people in is just use some of those tools. No, I think that's a great suggestion, Dr. Osterhoff. No, I was to say thank you. That's very helpful. I actually have read your paper, and <laughs> and I, I think that uh, you know, it's that kind of uh, empowerment that you're sharing with us right now. I think that is also a driving force. That it actually, it, it's 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 a positive element. You know, uh, in some ways, you you might want to run from the fire, and I think what you do is you help give us reasons to run to the fire, and I think that's what's really important today to hear and see that. And, and to understand why it's important. You know, I started, I started out with the children, you know, I, I, and I think we, you all have closed or dealt with the issue, you know, making this personal, making it real, making people feel it. You know, I think that's part of what this is all about. This is not an academic exercise. This is a way of life. This is, this is about our heart and soul issues. It's not just discussing or debating about a relative risk or, or somehow, you know, how do we do this analysis? This has got to start right at the very core of who we are to make it meaningful. Absolutely. I mean, one thing I want to just say about the flock, your flock question, which I think is very, (laughs) that's an amazing, I think a very, a really good question because oftentimes those of us who are in, in doing this work or, are from a marginalized population. Those are, you know, finding our flock is a resilience resource, yeah. right? That we develop over time um, out of necessity. And we don't even ask ourselves that question. How do we find our flock, right? It, it becomes something that we are just doing, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Right, right. And so I think you paused us so we that we could have this important conversation about how do you find your flock so that you are not standing in the gap alone because racism is so insidious and it has been so implanted and and given time to fester it needs many of us to stand in the gap um in order to to have to push back on it to you know if you're going to throw the stone in the water to create a ripple it needs many of us throwing that stone in the water um, so that the ripple becomes a wave um so what i want to do in our our last sort of uh about 20 minutes is sort of change the conversation just slightly um, and I think it'll catch many of the questions that we have coming in or that were, were posed by our, our listeners. And that is, we've seen COVID-19 operate in this continuum, and we've seen the racial disparities and other disparities attached to COVID-19 operate in a continuum, right? And meaning that first it was test access to testing, right? Um, and then it w- and it was access to care, and then now it's vaccinations, and you know there will be something next, right? Now that we see that this variant is um, ascending, right? Like our, you know. Mm-hmm. 
you know, the best place for us to have interrupted the cycle that of racism being mixed with this pandemic was at the beginning. And we are far from the beginning now. And we are not just at the end either. How, what do we do now to mitigate and minimize the further um, impact of what Dr. Jones is calling structural risk mm -hmm. on our society mm -hmm. and our Black, Indigenous, and persons of color in this country. And we can even extrapolate that um, to a global perspective as well. Well, you know, if I could add one piece here, I think that we are at a very critical moment in this pandemic in this very regard, because we know everything we need to know right now to deal with the following issue. Number one, there are states in this country that have literally abysmal records for outreach and getting populations vaccinated as we're talking about here. How, how will they be held accountable? Will they be held accountable? What will be the ways in which they will be pressured into doing the job they should do? Number two is this issue with the j and vaccine right now is a very real challenge. This is a vaccine that had many very positive aspects in terms of its dissemination, particularly in the communities of color uh, and how it could be taken into neighborhoods and how it could be administered in a way that uh, was in fact uh, the, the very supportive means we need to best address lack of vaccination in, in some populations. So now that we have this challenge, what are we gonna do about it? You know, we are in this pause, how will we get out of this? How will we make sure, certain that this vaccine, which we had intended to best use here, will in fact still either be available or what will be the alternatives? How will we make up for it? In other words, just don't use it as an excuse not to address that area. And frankly, from a global standpoint, you know, the two workhorse vaccines that were going to be very critical were the AstraZeneca vaccine and the J&J &J vaccine. Right. And so this is global equity issues. And, and I think that now we have a challenge with that. So how we respond to this, I think will say a lot about what we have learned, what we haven't learned, what we still need to learn and what we need to do. And so I, I think we are at a very critical time where this is, this is not rehashing an old issue about you know, uh, the issues of, of at risk. This is about real life situations. Now, how are we gonna respond? Are those Absolutely. discussions happening? Sorry, I took your, I, sorry, Dr. Slaughter AC, but I, I mean, I, I think it's important to, um, you know, for folks to understand too, if if those discussions are happening on how will we respond and how will we address the loss of the J&J &J vaccine and what, you know, what do, what do next steps look like there? And also who's at those discussions? Right. So the, so the, most, right. the most important thing is who's at these decision-making tables, who's interpreting it? So I have always, so, um, we don't even know. So I haven't seen the data yet about which communities got the J&J &J and yeah. did any of them get the J&J &J only? Which, you know, because from the beginning yeah. I said no community should only have one vaccine right. sent to it. Right. Every person in every community should have a choice between at least two vaccines. So yeah. I'm hoping that that's the case. I also was making the case, if you think that this vaccine is good for hard to reach, although all populations are reachable, you know, it's like right, right. hard for whom, yep. right? Yeah. But, but because, or maybe because there's no uh, electricity there, okay, or maybe, so that's a longer term thing, but maybe there are no freezers there. Well, bring freezers for some of the other vaccines. So, so, so we shouldn't accept the limits that make us want to use one particular vaccine in one setting. We should address those limits even as we roll it out. So this, this has been me and J&J &J from the beginning, okay? Mm -hmm. I am, um, so, so even if J&J &J is no longer available in the US and, and if it's no longer available in the US, we shouldn't be sending it anywhere else. 
Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's like, we got that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, we need to, I mean, a lot of this is if Pfizer and Moderna, for example, would, um, with, I don't know where this World Trade Organization discussions are now about the, you know, uh, the, what do you call those, the intellectual property rights and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, yeah. like we could loosen things that we wouldn't even be having, it wouldn't seem such an urgency if some of the other vaccines where some of these problems haven't right. been raised, were now able to be manufactured in India and South Africa, but in lots of different places around the world where they have the capacity to manufacture it, but don't have the recipe yet. So I think that we need to turn our attention to those discussions, especially as we want to also gear up the availability of vaccines worldwide. So I am afraid, I'm, I'm, I, I don't wanna see the analysis about differential distribution of the J&J &J vaccine by race. Yeah. Or even by community. But but we know that that's how people were sort of thinking about it. And all along, I said, no community should just get one vaccine. Right. And every every community needs to have a choice. I'm going to be quiet right now because this feels like a very tense um, issue to me. I'm afraid almost to see the data because I can already predict it. But what we need to do is if we can't use JJ, send freezers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Send right. freezers. Right. I, th I think this is a very important point. And this is, again, I think an example of where uh, we have to have a, a discussion that is first based on what data we have, but at the same time, constantly uh, doing that kind of analysis in the context of the racial issues we've talked about, the, uh, the you know, equity. And ironically, I will just say that you're absolutely right. C consumers should be able to choose. But we have seen a preferential desire for the J&J &J vaccine in many of our communities of color. Even if they had choices, that's what they wanted. So I just want to make sure that what we're attempting to do here is, in fact, meet the needs and the desires of the community. Because in the end, if a needle doesn't go in an arm, what is it good is that vaccine done? And what we need to do is find the ways to, within each community to work with that community to make certain that we're meeting their needs and not just what we want to call our criteria for what we're doing. And so I think that's that that's the point. And I think that's what you're you're absolutely right about that. We need to give choice so that we can best meet the needs of that community to get them vaccinated. And also, you know, if it's it's the reasons behind why did certain communities want J and J, right? If it's because yep. of the ease of one one shot, then make it easy to get two. You know, like Dr. Yep. Jones yep. said, bring bring freezers, show up in those communities, meet people where they're at. Um, because certainly that's going to be easier to get two shots than having to go someplace else to, right. to do so. That's right. Um, that's and right. have the people from the communities deciding this. Here we are. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've been vaccinated. I, I don't know what it's feeling like right now because I'm hiding in my house. Get the people <laughs> who, who, are, who, who still need the vaccine to help decide this. So absolutely. The yep, most important right. thing is yes. who's at decision making tables and who's not, what's on the agenda and what's not. I think that's absolutely, absolutely right. Um, yeah, that's right. There's actually a question um, I saw, I'm sure Dr. slaughter AC is getting to it at some point um, um, in the chat around that exact issue of who's at the decision making tables and the, the top down um, sort of hierarchical approach to um, all of the decisions that have been made around um, the vaccine distribution and sort of how do we break that cycle and when, you know, at what point um, do we allow for and create space, not allow for, but really create, create truly authentic spaces for community to say, here's what we need and here's what we want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think and also best. embracing some of those, the approaches that allow for that, right? So okay. I have a student um, I'm going to call her name out, Hadija Steen. She <laughs> has done such amazing things for her community in that she is a trusted member of her community and people come to her, right, with some of the problems of the community, especially around, around you know, within the context of, of COVID-19. And so she has organized testing venues within her community, which also happens to overlap with um, where George Floyd was murdered, right? So she has 
she has created that for her community, right? So this is like an informant-led approach. But in terms of trying to find funding that helps support that informant-led approach that invests in her community, mm-hmm. yeah, people, organizations, nonprofit and state, I'm going to call you out, do (laughs) not, are not flexible enough to invest in that. Right. And thus are part of the problem in addressing the equity issue. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And and, I was talking to a reporter the other day who was saying, well, how come we haven't seen more efforts like the um, Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium um, crop up across the country? And I said, you know, I actually think we have, it's just at a smaller scale because of the resource issue that you just named. Um, we're not nimble enough to put the, or mm-hmm. maybe it's something, it's other reasons behind that as well, right? That, that we, ha- we, haven't, we haven't, for whatever reason, been able to put the resources behind supporting um, folks like Khadija and others across this community, certainly, um, who are working really hard to bring um, access to their own communities. We haven't recognized those people as having expertise that we need to invest exactly. in and that we need to lift up. Mm-hmm. We need right. to recognize that we don't have all the answers in our little rooms and that the people yep. who are living in communities are already trying to solve the problems in their communities. We and just need the experts to, in that. And they're the experts, they need the investment, they need their voices lifted up and we should go to their tables or bring them to ours or have joint tables right. or whatever, but investment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, informant-based approach, approaches or community-based approaches are just as rigorous as top-down approaches. Um, And um, if not more, I'm gonna say scientific, (laughs) typically rigorous than our top-down approaches because they have a bigger impact, right? And public health is about impact. And so with that, with our last, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, and they're directly responsive to what the need is. Absolutely. And so with our last five minutes, I want to give each of our speakers a moment to um, say some concluding thoughts or um, points or questions that they want us to walk away with. I wrote down a few. (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) So in two minutes. So um, I really appreciated uh, Dr. Hardiman saying we needed to lift, to lead with equity. So there are three principles that I've articulated for achieving health equity. The first is valuing all individuals and populations equally. The second is recognizing and rectifying historical injustices. And the third is providing resources according to need. I don't have time to operationalize those for you all, but if you are trying to be about equity, say, am I doing that? Okay. I'll just say, when you're trying to figure out how you value all individuals and populations equally, think about how you value your, your children or your nieces and nephews. And they're like, you invest in them, you protect them, you celebrate them, you give them voice, you invite them, all of that. The second is, uh, was about the distribution of the J&J vaccine. Um, I was surprised, uh, Dr. Osterholm, when you said Tuskegee can't happen again, because my fear is that it just happened with the J&J rollout. So anyway, that was my, that's, that's, I don't want to see the data about that, but I know that that happened. And um, I think I cut out when I was talking before, but the most important thing, if you want to take anything home, is that inaction in the face of need is how structural racism very often shows up these days. And so we cannot be complacent with things. We can't leave our lovely homes, drive through a distressed, disinvested community, get to our little lovely safe jobs and not feel a strong sense of urgency to do something about that distressed, disinvested community we drove through. We cannot be sit in that comfort. Inaction in the face of need, as Dr. Osterholm has said, if you're not part of the, and, and I don't know who was it, uh, Huey Newton at the beginning or somebody back there said, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Inaction in the face of need is being part of the problem. So that's it. And oh, white folks need to be doing this work. And white folks don't need to wait for people of color to even teach you. You should have questions and then go read and learn or teach each other or go, go across town and stay a while. That's how you're most 
learn. If you go across town and you stay a while, if you learn from people who are doing the work in their communities and all, that's going to be your best. But don't ask them to teach you. Go and learn. Okay. Well, first of all, I'll, I'll leave the final remarks to Dr. Hardiman, but uh, let me just say, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to be here and be part of this. I do learn every time. So uh, I, I appreciate your comment, uh, Professor Jones, but I'll have to say I still am very vulnerable to learning. The older I get, I am more vulnerable. So I welcome that learning experience with you. Uh, I think the, the second part of this is, is that I, for one, am trying to find ways, avenues, uh, methods for bringing more people into this discussion in such a way that they don't feel like they have were forced into it, they want to be in it. This is such an important aspect of life. It's such an important, important aspect of who we are. What world will our kids grow up in? So I think from that perspective, uh, I, I, I want to find a way to motivate them in a, enough to get them hooked, that this is something that they must make a life priority. I think the final, the final point I would just make is, is that uh, I, I will say that, in, in, and I think that this is important to say too, uh, you know, I believe that the current administration, and you know, I am non-denominational when it comes to having worked in the last five presidential administrations, is doing all they can at this point to get input. Uh, and, and we know one of our colleagues who is now heading up the group for the administration on the issues around race. Um, to get input into the vaccine issue. The J&J &J one, I'm happy to report, I don't think that it is or will be a Tuskegee issue in that you know we had 6.8 million doses was it. And so we really didn't have vaccine to disseminate in the way that we did the other two vaccines. But I think it could become an issue like that. And I'm actually confident right now that there is a tremendous sensitivity, tremendous input at the upper echelons of the administration about equity and about the fact that it is going to be a very real uh, priority. And uh, so I, I'm actually optimistic that even though we have these challenges at the state levels, it's not because the federal government is not trying very hard to, to, to basically eliminate those differences. And I think that they will with the J&J &J vaccine do everything they can to make it along with other vaccines available um, where, where they need to be and, and allowing the consumer to make that decision and not have to be forced into a one or the other. So thank you again, very, very much. Um, recognizing you. we're past, we're past the, the, our time limit, I will just close by saying um, thank you to my colleagues for um, uh, agreeing to, to be on this panel. Um, it's been a wonderful conversation. And just to remind us that, you know, in all of this, we, you know, in all of the data and, you know, we're not talking about data points. Um, we're talking about people, people's lives, yep. people who are loved, people's families, um, who and people who have lost loved ones. And so as we continue this work, um, keeping that in the forefront of our minds is um, of utmost importance. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Thank you. Thank you um, to all of our panelists and to our audience for um, being here with us today for this very important conversation. Um, if you have, uh, you're here with us, you will receive an evaluation form, um, and we are very much interested in your, your feedback um, so that we can continue to grow this, mm -hmm. um, this forum uh, as we go forward. And on that note, I am going to sign off, and then I'm going to go run and get the second shot of my Pfizer vaccine. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank this you. Was Thank you. Bye -bye. Happy vaccine day, Jamie. <laughs>